be going. So Titus chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10. And as we come to this text, there was just this week as I prepared and prayed, uh, there was, there was a, an individual in my life that I just couldn't and didn't want to nor ever get away from. And his name is Earl Buell. Earl was one of the elders at Calvary Bible Church in Haley. He was uh, a giant of a man who with a good set of heels stood about five foot zero inches tall. He was from Schenectady, New York. And he loved to tell you about that. And Earl was just an amazing example of a godly man. And he was an example of our text. And as I think of Earl and as I think of our text, I'm reminded of what Scripture tells us regarding how our lives are representative of crowns. You see, Scripture tells us that we will receive a crown of life for the works that we have done, really the works that God has done through us, that we have walked in them, and that there will be those things which are jewels, which are adorned on that crown for those works, and that one day we will lay those crowns down at the Lord's feet. And as we recognize that, that's exactly what we see in our text today, and this is where our title comes from, and I've titled our text, Your Earthly Possessions. You have a, an outline there in your bulletin, and as you think of it, something comes to mind, uh, please write those down, or cross-references or other details, would love to have you to make some notes, as the Lord will certainly reward that effort. But let's take a look at our text, and then we'll make some comments about it. Follow along as I read Titus chapter 2 and verses 1 to 10. But as for you, speak things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible in all things, to show yourselves to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Our text this morning, Your Earthly Possessions, has a theme that I've assigned to it, five features of faith required for your spiritual maturity. Five features of faith required for your spiritual maturity. And as we consider where we've been in the book of Titus, Titus chapter 1 and verse 1 we saw the beginning of this wonderful book with the second longest introduction in any of Paul's epistles. One of incredible power and depth focusing on the Word of God. In the next section, Paul instructs Titus to carry this forward by appointing elders in every city and church. And the need for elders was clear. It was to proclaim doctrine. And to do so from a sound spiritual foundation. That is, soundness in the home, their children and wives, and everything under their control in their home. Soundness in their moral character and fabric. And soundness from an exter external perspective as others looked upon them. And the dangers to the church at the end of chapter 1 made it so clear why this was necessary. So having exposed us to all the critical aspects of the church, we climb ever closer to the pinnacle at the end of chapter 2. And as we climb, we move to the first major direct application in these five features that your life must exemplify. The example of dignity which must exist in each church and must exist in each of us, you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's go to our first point, which I've titled, A Crown of Power. 
a crown of power. Paul begins by admonishing Titus, giving him a command to speak and emphatically doing so, saying, you yourself speak. Typically, the imperative verb in Greek by itself carries so much impact and emphasis that it stands alone. But here, Paul has added the pronoun you to make it even more emphatic. You yourselves speak. The church must know what is involved in these characteristics if it is to succeed and if it is to move forward. The content of what he commanded to speak is sound doctrine. Now, one of the main themes in chapter 1 was that of faith. We saw it in verse 1, the faith of those chosen of God. Verse 4, the common faith that we have. Verse 6, faithful children. Verse 9, the faithful word. Even in verse 15, those that are without faith. But chapter 1 and verse 13 has perhaps the most important reference, if you'd look back at verse 13 of chapter 1 with me where it ends, for this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. Well, now, Paul is commanding Titus to speak things of sound doctrine. Faith was the main point of chapter 1, and now doctrine becomes the main point of chapter 2. Doctrine was also important in chapter 1. We saw it. In verses 9 and 11, verse 9 specifically addressing sound doctrine. And the main concept of doctrine undergirds our entire text in these 10 verses occurring in verse 1 and 3 and 7 and 10, four times for emphasis. And the idea of soundness or sound doctrine literally means that which is healthy. Paul is here addressing spiritual health of the church. And we all understand the idea of being healthy. We're entering into the cold and flu season. This horrific COVID continues to rear its ugly head and people are sick. And the the first thing we want is we want to be well again. As we pray for our beloved brothers and sisters battling through cancer, we pray that they will be well and healed. For children that are ill, we pray for their health again. And nothing is more important in the church than being doctrinally healthy or doctrinally sound. And the result of doctrinal soundness is to cause obedience. Obedience. Good orthodoxy, as it is said, is to result in good orthopraxy. As we have sound doctrine, it's to result in sound practices in our life. We must obey God's word. We all know that. But the question is, do we do it? 2 Corinthians 2.9 says, For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. In all things, beloved. Not in the big things, not in the doctrinal things, but in all things. Every little thing. If anything is not obedient to the word, it must be brought into that obedience. Scripture says that we must take every thought captive in 2 Corinthians 10 to Every thought. Beloved, we must consider every area of our life and we must expose it to the white hot light of God's word and that is to sound doctrine. And that's because all scripture is inspired by God. This word, this doctrine is breathed out to us by God. And it is that which is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, but more than that, equipped for every good work. If we're going to do the works that God has ordained that we would walk in them, we must be equipped with sound doctrine. Revelation 1.3 further carries this forward. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Beloved, the time is near. We don't know what the end times prophecy will look like and what all of the timetable will be, but we understand as we see more and more events every day and we have seen a horrific example of that yesterday with the attack on Israel the worst since 1973, and hundreds killed by the militant group Hamas. 
Now, this does not mean that the end times are coming this week or next. And it could be that Israel could be completely removed from the land and God's timetable would not be affected. But it appears things are moving closer. And we must be ready and we must hear and act. Paul says we must be sound in our doctrine. We can't, beloved, be obedient to what we don't know. If what you know is wrong, your supposed obedience is disobedience. Isn't that right? If what we know is wrong, that which we think we're doing in obedience is actually disobedience. Many are very sincere in their beliefs, but they are sincerely wrong. This is exactly what's going on in the Middle East right now. Beloved, you are receiving sound doctrine. This is a crown of power, but what are you doing with it? A crown of power is not only the focus of our lives, but it is the focus of the rest of our text. For out of it springs the foundation of the rest of our verses. Look at our second point with me, which I've titled, A Crown of Permanence. A Crown of Permanence. Paul now turns to the first group-specific section in his letter to Titus, and that is older men. And the first question that always arises is, who are these? Who are the older men in the church? The Greek word is unique and is presbutes, and it is connected to the term for elder, which you may be more familiar, presbuteros. It's our word for an older man, but it is specifically focused to the element of maturity. For the elder, there are three different terms that every elder must embrace, different aspects of his role, that is overseer, the one who watches over the church, the shepherd who feeds the church, and the elder, that is the mature, that is the wisdom. And so also we see in this term that same connotation. Age is an underlying factor, but more prominent here is spiritual maturity. Now, there is an inherent idea of one with more years, to be sure. But what is that? If you're a 15-year-old, a 40-year-old seems ancient. And if you're a 10-year-old, at 25, you're already up there. So somewhere in that range, we might say, could be that age. But for those who think themselves, and some often do, think they're too old to still be actively engaged in church, that they've gotten past that age and they're just kind of waiting now. Well, for those who see themselves in that camp, here's a little example to consider. At the age of 83, after having traveled some 250,000 miles on horseback, preached more than 40,000 sermons and produced some 200 books and pamphlets, John Wesley regretted that he was unable to read and write for more than 15 hours a day without his eyes becoming too tired to work. After his 86th birthday, he admitted to an increasing tendency to lie in bed until 5.30 in the morning. So how are you all doing with the age thing? Now, we could spend a lot of time discussing what defines an older man, but Paul has two designations here. He has the older man and the younger man. So if you think you're getting out of the way of Paul's spiritual arrows, you're not, because everyone is covered in these groups. So if you don't fit in the older group, you default to the younger and be ready. That's coming shortly. Permanence is the gauge by which this maturity is measured. That is continuing on in a life of faithfulness and maturity. That which lasts, that which is tested by time. And spiritual maturity is the concept that's being conveyed. So this person has significant spiritual maturity in the faith. And this is to belong to those who have greater age. And again, although age is a factor, you can be old and still be spiritually immature. And likewise, you can be young and be spiritually mature. So you can assess yourselves and decide which of these categories you fall into. Paul illustrates the spiritual maturity by dividing these into six characteristics in verse 2. They're grouped into two groups of three. The first group is temperate, dignified, and sensible. Temperate is the idea of not overindulgent. And there's more than just alcohol that's being conveyed here. It can be anything. All have a propensity to be blank holics, and you can fill in the blank. 
alcoholics, workaholics, lustaholics, spendaholics, eataholics. And this is something that has to be fought against. Temperate is someone who is moderate and controlled in that regard. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So being temperate is one who has stopped sinning, who is not giving to those urges of sin, and one who has a knowledge of God. Furthermore, in 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So those that are temperate, those that are mature, are men of action. They are men who have fixed their hope completely on Christ. The next characteristic is dignified. This is a man who is honorable. One commentator notes this man would never laugh at immorality or vulgarity or anything that is sinful or ungodly. Beloved, we must be careful not to jest and to laugh about that for which our Savior bled and died. Hebrews 10.29 reminds us, How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and insulted the Spirit of grace? Our world takes the most vulgar and horrific things and turns them into comedies in order to make light of them because there's so much darkness that they'll do anything to get a laugh. Don't let that be us. Next is sensible. This could be translated as prudent, and it means having a sound or healthy mind. That is, not given to irrational impulses. One who has control of himself and who doesn't give in to the things of his flesh or the world that lead him into destruction. The second group of three are all guided by the premise of being sound. Soundness is the same word we discussed in our first point from verse 1. And it is the idea, again, of being spiritually healthy. And this comes from doctrinal soundness. The three areas in which a mature man is to be sound are in faith and in love and in perseverance. Sound in faith. This is spiritually healthy in faith. It means a man that is well grounded and established and understands the doctrine of his faith. One who knows what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 means. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works that no one may boast. Our faith is not something we choose. It's not something we earned. It's not something we were good enough to deserve. It's that which God has given to us. And the mature man understands that. And he grasps it. grounded in a right understanding of the word. The, the author of Hebrews tells us that we ought not be desiring milk, but be ready for the meat of the word. Next is soundness in love. This is spiritually healthy in love, meaning to love others above ourselves. Being sacrificial, as Ephesians 5.21 says, where it says submitting ourselves one to another. Understanding more than just Brotherly love, just phileo love, but truly understanding agape love, understanding sacrificial commitment one to another within the body, making others more important than ourselves. This is what it means to be sound in love, sound in perseverance, spiritually healthy in patience, being steadfast, not just enduring, but peacefully abiding in what life brings. This is so important for men. I mean, we can all get through the tough times, right? We can grunt it out, pull ourselves up by our boots, bootstraps. I'm going to get through this. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about being content. This is talking about moving through difficulties in life and recognizing and abiding peacefully in all that life brings, the good or the bad. We're reminded here of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience. And again, not fruits, but a, a fruit of the Spirit. All of those things bringing that peace and that contentment and that patience as we go through life. The crown of permanence is one who is living, ever trusting, rejoicing in God's sovereign will. 
He is one who, as the text tells us, is temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, sound in love, and sound in perseverance. But the danger and the current issue is what's not happening. Namely, older men are not acting in a mature way. They're not modeling maturity. They're not discipling younger men towards this maturity. And what happens in that case? The age barrier, the generation gap, where the younger generation says, you know, we don't need those old people. Put them on the shelf. Get them out of the way. They're simply clogging up our potential for Social Security and our medical system. That's a problem. Because there's a tremendous element of wisdom that exists for those that have walked through maturity. But worse than that, it's extinction. And not just in the world, but in the church. Not death, but extinction. Because without proper discipleship, the biblical maturity of the church is lost. It becomes extinct. Younger men are left to find their own way. Look at many of our churches what does the musical portion of the worship look like? Well, the stage has got to be up about here. The ceiling's cranked up above it. There's smoke machines coming from both sides. Lights and lasers. And the music is so loud, you could sing with all of your hearts and all of your voices and never hear yourself because the amplification is so loud. And I ask, is, is that corporate worship? No, it's not. It's not. Preaching? There's no preaching. We have 15-minute sermonettes for Christianettes, right? I'm going to come up, I might read a Bible verse, and then I'm going to go talk about what happened in my life this week or how great I am. Well, that's really helpful. No, no respect. No respect for elders. No consideration of what those that have lived longer than us have gone through. And why is this happening? Because older men are not acting mature and are not discipling younger men. So the younger are left to their own devices and the church fails due to extinction. Because older men are not acting mature and passing that to younger men. Well, the extinction of the church is a pretty significant problem, wouldn't you agree? Now, the way to keep the church from extinction is to exercise this crown of permanence through that crown of power through sound doctrine. Our third point is a crown of piety in verses 3 to 5. A crown of piety, and there's two facets to this crown of piety. A crown of piety displayed and a crown of piety derived. A crown of piety displayed and a crown of piety derived. Now, we understand this distinction when we consider Crowns in a homecoming event, for instance. The homecoming queen, she has the biggest crown. And the court, the princesses, they're all a little smaller down below her. And this is the distinction between piety displayed and piety derived. This point carries forward our previous discussion as the text begins in verse 3, older women likewise. Now, I know you all will remember our discussion from our devotional series on 1 Timothy that we did in our daily emails where we talked about this same construction. How the first seven verses talked about elders and then verse 8 and forward talked about deacons and it began deacons likewise. The reason was because there were no main verbs in verses 2 to 7 and the main verbs in verse 1, aspiring and desiring, carried into verse 8. The same thing happens here. There is no main verb in verse 2, so we go back to verse 1, which is Paul's command to Timothy to speak. So now he is again commanding, or to Titus rather, he is commanding Titus to speak, this time to older women. And I have to confess, this is a little more challenging. I, I, can, I can preach to you men, younger and older, and stomp all over your toes, and it doesn't bother me a bit. But when we talk to the women in the group, it's a little more challenging for me. And so also it was here, and I think this is what we recognize in this structure, older women likewise. It's the identical connotation here as older men. The word is identical with a different gender, and it further supports that the idea is not that of age, but of maturity. 
In Greek, the regular words for men and women are quite different. And he could have simply added the adjective old to it. So we had old men and old women, but he doesn't do that. Rather, he uses the identical word with a different ending to indicate male and female gender. We have presbutes for men and presbutis for women. And the point is to carry forward the concept of maturity. And the word likewise further solidifies that carryover. And we see that in our point in text. And the characteristics of these mature women in the church is next on display. Only now, it's a different perspective. It isn't simply permanence or exhibiting this over time. But now there is a new emphasis on holiness, on piety. These older women are to exemplify a crown of piety. And there are four characteristics that govern this pious maturity in a crown of piety displayed in verse 3. Look at it again with me. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. Reverent. This is the guiding concept of the entire section. This is the concept of piety, and it means suitable for that which is sacred, Conduct that is fitting of a religious person. This means living your life in such a way that your faith is evident. Not worshiping God on Sunday and living like the world or the devil the next six days of the week. The second characteristic is not malicious gossips. This term appears 34 times in the New Testament. It is so significant that it is repeated over and over again. It's the familiar Greek word diabolos. It's where we get our English word diabolical. In one form, it's translated as the slanderer, and it refers to Satan, diabolo in Spanish, the one who constantly makes accusation in Revelation 12.10. This means not only refusing to spread such slanderous speech, but refusing even to listen to it. Gossip is so prevalent and so common that it is talked about over and over in Scripture. And and we can't have any part of it. Here's how this looks, and for those of you that have served as pastors or elders, you perhaps know this, but this is my standard approach. When people come up to me and they say, Pastor, I need to tell you about such and such, and I say, wait a minute, before you go any further, let me tell you what's going to happen next. When you tell me what you're going to tell me, I am going to tell you that you need to go speak to that person about what you're telling me because your biblical role is to go and either correct or redirect them on this matter. And after you tell me, I'm going to give you about a week and then I'm going to come and talk to you and find out if you've spoken to that person and if not, I'm going to take you and we're going to go. It's amazing how that slows the conversation down. So what is gossip? I think that's a very important distinction, and I want to share with you a definition that was given to me by my biblical counseling professor at the Master Seminary, John Street, and I think it's an excellent uh, uh, definition. I've used it repeatedly and will continue. The definition of gossip is this, that it is gossip if you are not directly involved with the problem or directly involved with the solution. The one is in gossip if he is speaking about that which he is not directly involved in the problem or directly involved in the solution. That means if this is not directly affecting you and you're talking about it, and if you're not directly involved in correcting or reprimanding the situation, then your speaking about it is gossip. And it doesn't mean, oh, pastor, I heard about this and I'm praying about it, so I want to tell you about it or I want to hear more of the scoop. No. No. This insidious and danger of gossip can't be overstated. Diabolos. And yet it is all but ignored because it is so common. Our world continually promotes this kind of gossip as if it were right. Oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? No. No. And it is so impactful because it destroys a church. And we cannot have any of it. We cannot have any of it. Third, 
is not enslaved to much wine. A slave to me, enslaved means literally to be held against one's will. And the danger of alcohol, which is behind this, is so evident. We spoke of this on our devotional series in 1 Timothy 3 regarding elders. But being enslaved to wine shames the name of Christ. And it casts dispersion on the church. And it often ends up drawing others in. Now, we have to be so careful here. It's so easy to be legalistic or to be lawless or antinomian, to say, the Bible says you can't drink. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. So then the other side is, well, the Bible says you can drink, so I'm going to drink all I want. No, it doesn't say that either. We have to recognize what Scripture says and be so careful about this dangerous entity. Next is teaching what is good, that is right or good doctrine, that which is noble and excellent or holy and godly. These are vital concepts which must be addressed when women get together. Teaching crafts is fine. Having fellowship is fine. But the focus must be upon piety. It must be upon holiness. It must be upon the older women bringing to the younger women that which they so desperately need to understand. And this is a crown of piety displayed because it is displayed for all to see. Because if you can't see it displayed, then it can't be derived by another. And that takes us to the next part in verse 4, the second half of this, a crown of piety derived. Having seen the crown of the homecoming queen, now we look at the crown of her courts. And the court knows what the crown of the queen looks like and how to attain that crown of honor when they see it. Look at verses 4 and 5 with me so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Here is the purpose of the crown of piety. It's not the righteous standard for the sake of righteousness. It's so that it may be passed on. Older women are to encourage younger women. This word encourage can also be translated train or disciple. And it is here that the entire text gets its meaning, this idea of discipleship, literally to cause one to be of sound mind and self-control. Very closely related to the word sensible, we saw back in chapter 1 and verse 8 for elders and in verse 2 of chapter 2. This is why the idea of discipleship is prominent in this text. Why it must be occurring in our churches. This discipleship is training through encouragement. They're training them in love, namely in loving their husbands and in loving their children. Only time in the New Testament that these words are used, and of course it relates specifically to married women loving their husbands and children. Dr. MacArthur notes on these verses, No biblical standard is more viciously attacked today than the God-ordained role of women in society. And no passage is more ridiculed or reinterpreted by assailants within the church than these two verses. As with many worldly influences, the feminist movement has made great inroads in the church, including the evangelical church. In the name of women's rights, the word of God is dishonored as being sexist, chauvinistic, and unfairly limiting. Some feminists maintain that standards set forth in these and similar passages were culturally oriented to New Testament times or were simply Paul's personal beliefs. In either case, they are considered irrelevant and non-binding for Christians today. The God-ordained institutions of marriage and family, which are the primary foundation of a healthy society, are attacked as archaic and outrageous, or at best, unnecessary. Tragically, many unthinking, poorly taught Christians are seduced by feminist rhetoric into believing that traditional roles of women in the family, in society, and in the church are outdated and oppressive. The phrase women's liberation has an attractive democratic ring, which on the surface seems reasonable and justified. It has special appeal, of course, to women who feel unappreciated, restricted, exploited, victimized, and trapped by the traditional roles and opportunities for women, end quote. 
Radical feminism is not a new idea in the 20th century. It was going on in the church that Paul was writing to Titus about. And Paul calls older women to teach these younger women five primary characteristics, beginning in verse 5. And the first is sensible. This is the same word in our second point for mature men, again also back in chapter 1 and 8 for elders, and it'll come up again in chapter 2 and verse 12. Prudent is next, which means having a healthy mind, not giving to rash impulses. Then we have pure, which means to be free from sin, to be innocent or blameless. In 2 Corinthians 7.11, Paul says, For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Paul is here describing godly repentance versus worldly sorrow. And that that repentance brings innocence, not to mention bringing vindication and and bringing longing and zeal. Next is workers at home. Here is where we can really get some rub. Now, if I were the pastor, I'd be getting some emails, but you can send those to Jim. (laughs) No, not really. You can send them to me. I'd love to talk to you about them. But the word literally means being a homemaker. Not a popular term with some, but a biblical one. The first priority of women is keeping the home. Men are to provide for the home. Women are to keep the home. Again, not modern conceptions, but biblical ones. Remember our previous two terms from verse 3, loving husbands and loving children critical for the foundation of the family. Does this mean women can't work? No. Again, we have to be careful that we don't err on legalism or lawlessness. No, a woman ought not work. That's legalism. That's not right. Oh, well, a woman can work anywhere all the time regardless of what's going on at home. No, that's lawlessness. That's not right either. We have to strike that balance, and each one is different. We have to recognize that the primary responsibility of the married woman is in the home. Now, there may be opportunities where the children are gone for a part of the day and they're in, she's working out of the home. Or maybe that she's working in the home while the children are there or even when they're gone. But take a look at Proverbs 31. This is an excellent place to recognize this broad distinction. The woman worked. She worked at making things in the home. She worked at providing for the home. So important for us to understand. Our fourth characteristic is kind, and and we all know what kindness looks like when someone is kind to us, showing brotherly love or considerate or tenderhearted. In Acts 9.36, we have Dorcas, Tabitha, which Jim preached on last week, the woman abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. That's her expression of kindness, or Acts 28, and the natives taking the shipwreck, Victims in and building the fire and showing them kindness. Fifth is being subject to their own husbands. Not to all men, but to their own husbands. Being submissive. That doesn't mean being a doormat. The biblical picture of submission is voluntarily placing yourself under the headship of another. And the purpose of all of this is so that the word of God will not be dishonored. People are watching, and when they see women acting contrary to the Word, the Word of God is dishonored. The other similar aspect to men is in what often isn't happening. This was so important because many women were not doing this. They were not discipling younger women. And the critical importance of women in this role is exhibited by these three verses which are addressed to you mature women and to the younger ladies and what they're to learn. Men are the independent ones. Social activities are less critical. But for women, 
these events more prominently affect one another because of their social interactions. Remember, Paul writes this because this is the problem of the day. For men, getting together is not such a big deal, but for ladies, it is, right? And so that interaction needs to be more focused. And so it is, again, even more vital for the ladies today. And this is the point of the text for older women teaching younger. It is the point of this section of Titus 2. It is the personal discipleship effort. It is small group discipleship. It is one-on-one or one-on-two. It is those of you that are mature passing that information to those that are less so. The purpose of discipleship is so that the church will not become extinct. And that happens when we exude that crown of power, that crown of permanence, and that crown of piety. So how are you doing? If you're older, think of the things that you are exuding. How are you doing in these qualifications? And to whom are you passing them along? You must find younger people whose lives you can impact and reach out and keep reaching out. Man, I know, we just like to pull back and say, you know, uh, we're all doing fine. If somebody has a problem, they'll come talk to me. No! Because we know we don't talk to one another. Right? Get out there and talk to these younger men. Ask them for coffee. If they say no, ask them again. Ask them how they're doing in their marriage. When they say fine, ask them again. They're not. We must pass these issues down. And if you're younger and you recognize there's things you need, come to some of these older men. Say, I want to get together with you. I could use to talk to you about what it means to have a godly marriage. I could use to talk to you about what it means to be faithful in my job. I could use to talk to you about what it takes to raise a children because we have two screaming around the house and I'm ready to tear my hair out. And I'm gone eight hours a day. Beloved, if... If we focus on God's word, he will accomplish this in our church. He will do a great work in our midst and he will move forward so that we are not in the danger of our church becoming extinct. Because for those of us that are older, we recognize that the goal is for this church to succeed and to thrive and that strong doctrine continues to come forth from this pulpit to the encouragement of the people that are sitting here and that more would come. That happens if we're faithful. That happens if we're faithful. Earl Buell died, but not before passing on his spiritual maturity. He may have been a five-foot, somewhat portly man, but he was a seven-foot giant in my eyes. Earl came to me as a new believer and knew that I needed some help and didn't just let me walk away. And he exemplified what it meant to be a godly husband as I watched him open the door for Betty every single time they went into or out of a building or a car. I carry around Earl's bookmark from his funeral in my Bible that has Amazing Grace on the front and the Romans Road gospel presentation on the back because I want to remember what it means to be a godly man and to carry that to other godly men. Certainly, I could have done a better job of listening and learning, but I recognize that there is still more work for me to do. And I stand as a testimony to this man. So is this your legacy, beloved? It needs to be. Not so that you'll be remembered, but so that Christ's church will thrive and grow. And that we'll carry forth those gifts that God has given to us and that others have poured into us to other men and to other women. Because that's when Heritage Bible Church will have that foundation and that legacy that will carry forth for not just years, but generations to come, should the Lord tarry. May He find us faithful to each embrace this because brothers and sisters, every one of us fits in one of these roles. And I believe many of you are good, mature believers. So embrace God's command to you to pour into others.
Father, we praise you for the admonition of your word. We praise you for the power that you give to us through your Holy Spirit to accomplish this work. Father, I pray particularly for my older and more mature brothers and sisters. Strengthen us each, Father, to think deeply on what you have called us to today. To think deeply on who and how and when we will engage in being obedient, in taking the strong doctrine that you have taught to us and to put it into practice for your glory and for your honor. For our younger believers, encourage their hearts today. Help them to know of our desire and our love and that our, our slowness and, Father, that our, our tendency not to carry this forward is not a lack of desire but it is simply, Father, an insecurity. So help those to know to come, and Father, for those that don't know you today, help them to realize that it is only through your word and through these truths that life can be lived to its full and that we can understand the hope and joy and the glory of heaven that awaits us. We praise you, Father, for our time together for the glory of knowing Christ and have been raised out of this world to be seated on the solid rock that none can shake. Father, we praise you for our time together. Be glorified in our lives, and we give you thanks, knowing this is all your work, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.